So, so yeah, my name is Paul. Um, I just flew in from Canada yesterday. So, uh, so I'd like to start by apologizing. Uh, so I'm sorry. Uh, I have 45 minutes here uh, slotted for this talk. And there's, there's probably no way it all fits in. Um, so I'm sorry, it'll probably be truncated. If you see me slowing down, maybe give me the wheels motion to remind yourself to pick up speed. Uh, I'd like to cover as much as possible. Um, this is, uh, no, I've lost my talk. This is a talk that I call, uh, overview, 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 um, with, uh, with, with good reason, I think. Um, let's see here, presenter view. Pull this fellow over here. Yeah, uh, yeah, everything. Um, everything about PostGIS from, uh, from the beginning to the end. Oh, where's my little uh, presenter view guy? Does that work? No, that's the wrong one. How about that one? All right, everything about PostGIS. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm Paul, I'm not just a random Paul. Um, I'm a Paul who was at PostGIS from the very start. Uh, I think I've got a little bit of a history in here, but not, at the, not right at the beginning. Um, so why do we want to talk about PostGIS at all, the motivation of this talk? Um, you're a developer, you're working on a project, the boss says, you need to add a map to the app. You think, oh, I need a computer map. Um, how am I gonna get that? Uh, and if you are a babe in the woods and you go on the internet, um, it's not entirely <laughs> unlikely that, uh, that someone will come to you and say, hey, by golly, my friend, what you need to do is buy a GIS, 100% <clears throat> polygon crunching, line string smushing GIS. Um, but if you are already building your app on top of Postgres and you have PostGIS, you already have a GIS. That's sort of my, my core takeaway, the core motivation of everything else that I'm about to say to you. So what am I talking about when I say PostGIS? Post uh, I am talking about a spatial database, which is to say a database. Um, a database is a piece of software. It, uh, it is built for random access of large corpuses of data and summary of that data. Um, and in order to do that, it provides you with some primitive types. Um, and in a standard database, that would be strings, floats, dates, things like that. Um, indexes that make sense for those types. Um, so B trees and hash indexes for fast random access and joins, and then functions that understand those types. So if you have a string, a reasonable t function to have against strings is string length. If you have some numbers, a reasonable function to have for those numbers is an exponentiation function. Um, if you have dates, a reasonable function to have is now or uh, date math. The only thing that differs um, for a spatial database is that you stick the word spatial in front of all those categories. Um, so in addition to the primitive types, you have spatial types. Um, your columns can include text, and they can include dates, and they can include numbers, and they can also include geometries and geographies. And you have indexes that make sense against those spatial types. So not one-dimensional indexes like B-trees, but multi-dimensional indexes like R-trees and quad-trees and KD-trees. And then you have functions that understand those types. So if you have a geometry, it makes sense to ask, what is the length of that geometry? Uh, if you have two geometries, it makes sense to ask, how far apart are they, or do they touch each other? So that's, that's what uh, all, all that a spatial database is. It is the addition of some extra types that you can use in exactly the same way you use all the other types in your database. Um, reasoning by analogy, if you understand the product portfolio of Oracle, Oracle spatial is to Oracle, as PostGIS is to PostgreSQL. All Oracle spatial is is some extra spatial types that sit next to all the other standard primitive types inside Oracle. And the larger spatial database market, if you're looking around, you're really only going to bump up against three sort of fully capable spatial databases. That would be Oracle Spatial, the Spatial Type in SQL Server, and then PostGIS itself. Everything else gen generally tends to be either niche, um, restricted to particular use cases, um, and generally relatively limited in functionality. Um, all those major implementations uh, in the spatial database marketplace follow a few common specifications. Uh, the initial specification that drove Spatial database development was the simple features for SQL specification from the OpenGL Spatial Consortium, um, superseded about five or 10 years later by the ISO uh, SQL MM Part 3 for Spatial Temporal. Just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? SQL MM Part 3 for Spatial Temporal. Um, 
And what those specifications have in common is they tend to provide a large suite of functions. In the case of the OGC spec, maybe 60. In the case of the ISO spec, maybe 300 or so. Functions that start with ST, that's the spatial temporal part, and then some functional bit. Um, you'll see this ST function pattern showing up all over the place. Um, and it's sort of a sign, oh, hey, these people have tried to follow the standard as much as they could while building their spatial database. Um, the thing that's sort of exciting to me is a Postgres developer. Postgres has been around long enough at this point and, uh, and has enough industry penetration that even when multi-billion dollar international companies like Google add spatial to their database, they don't say, you know, the lead line is we've added, uh, we've added a system which is compatible with ISO SQL MEM part three for spatial temporal. They say, we've added a spatial extension that is compatible with Postgres. It's like, aha. The standard definition of what it means to be a spatial database is migrated from the thing that ISO wrote to the thing that I wrote. So that's pretty awesome, at least to me. Um, so why would you look at a spatial database, in particular PostGIS? Um, in the world of GIS, we've had some pretty bad data management practices um, in the past. It was not uncommon for, say, a major city to store their GIS data in large file systems, uh, hierarchically arranged of shape files and geodatabase files, and if you're lucky, geopackage files. Um, that's not so good for versioning. It's really not good for building systems that expose consistent views of the enterprise data. Um, so one of the things you get when you pull all the data together into one database is the ability to build applications against a single point of truth and know that different organizations, different parts of the organization will be sharing that truth together. Um, it also makes it really much easier to build the apps themselves um, because there is a standard language for accessing the data and for analyzing the data, and that language is SQL, SQL, the Structured Query Language. Um, you're not writing to a particular vendor's API, you're not writing to a particular open source language API, you're writing to the international standard which has been around for 40 years, SQL. It's a great way to systematize the building of your spatial applications. And if your database underneath has enough functionality, it starts to radically thin out your applications. And that's what I'm going to be talking about for the rest of the morning. So what do you need to out of your spatial database for it to be considered like an enterprise spatial database, something which is suitable to be used in a big organization to provide that kind of single point of truth. Um, need integration with a large set of third-party applications. So as Adam said, you don't have to build everything up from scratch. Um, you need a baseline set of functionality in terms of indexes and types and functions. And then you need all the sort of enterprise-y things um, around security, reliability, and scalability, which you expect for a large organization. So does PostGIS slash PostgreSQL have those things? Sure. Uh, Third-party integration. Well, once upon a time, we invented PostGIS and nobody knew what it was, and it didn't work with anything. Um, but that was almost 20 years ago. Nowadays, PostGIS is, in many respects, the industry standard, and pretty much every piece of GIS software out there understands how to do a direct connection to it and read the types. Proprietary world, the biggest one is ArcGIS. Open source world, the biggest one is QGIS. But pretty much every desktop GIS will talk to PostGIS these days. Um, pictures of QGIS, because I think it's a lovely product. More pictures of QGIS, more pictures of QGIS. Um, suffice to say, it's a really big, complex project. Product. Uh, if you're familiar with ArcMap, ArcView, you are sort of by default familiar with QGIS. If you haven't tried QGIS, go to QGIS.org, download it, and try it. Uh, you've been missing out. Um, middleware, you're building web apps. Same story, all the middleware talks to PostGIS, um, most common proprietary one, ArcGIS, most common open source one, GeoServer, but also MapServer, Tegela, Mapnik. All these uh, middlewares for building web apps speak to PostGIS natively. Uh, some of them as sort of the first thing they ever talked to. MapServer was the very first uh, web server to talk to PostGIS. And then language integration. You're building an app on top of this database. You need to be able to tie your language, your custom app, to the database. Every language in use today has a high performance direct connection to Postgres and understands the idea of spatial types and can pull that data out and use it natively. It's pretty awesome. So having that level of integration with third party products allows you to build hybrid architectures. They all talk to the central database so you can string them together, even things which might not want to talk to each other. QGIS and ArcGIS don't have any obvious integration points together, but if you talk, stick them against the same database, voila, they are in fact ipso facto integrated. They're talking to the same data. You make a change in ArcGIS, you see it in QGIS. It shows up in your web app. It shows up in your client's internet browsers. That's the beauty of putting everything together with the system in the middle that can talk to all the other parts. 
So who is using Postis? This is not a client list for Crunchy. This is a list of organizations I've put together over the years who said, hey, we use Postis and we find it kind of cool. Um, big government organizations. Uh, the very first big government uh, reference client we had in Postis only about three years after the initial release was IGN, the Institut de Geographique Nationale. That's the French National Mapping Agency. Uh, they used it to manage their, and still use it, to manage their um, B2 Uni base map project, which is a, a base map of all of France, uh, about 120 million planimetric features. Um, but after EGN, pretty much every national mapping agency began deploying PostGIS for one thing or another, Natural Resources Canada, um, the FCC, NREL, Landgate in Australia, the Portuguese National Mapping Agency, Ordnance Survey in the UK, all of them are using PostGIS for one thing or another. Same thing in the corporate world. Um, so people with big collections of imagery, they don't necessarily store their imagery in the database, that's not a great pattern. Storing image metadata in the database is a wonderful pattern allows you to find the images you care about before you push them to your processing pipeline. So Google does that, Digital Globe does that. And you see in the defense intel space, SAIC, Bell Aerospace, um, and even in the, in the media. You can find the New York Times has written blog posts about how they move their databases to Postgres and PostGIS. Um, and with the rise of the cloud and people running, uh, running cloud databases, um, in addition to be running Postgres in the cloud, all the Postgres instances also include PostGIS builds. Um, and if you're building your own managed cluster, you can put together a cluster that includes Postgres and PostGIS. There's really no reason for the installation of PostGIS to not be as simple as Adam pointed out. It's nothing but logging into your Postgres database and typing create extension PostGIS, and now you have a spatial database. Um, all this started about 18 years ago. Yeah, because it's 2019. Um, back in Victoria, British Columbia, uh, at the time I was running a small consulting company called Refractions Research, um, there I am. Uh, I, I get billed as a co-founder of PostGIS, and that's because um, I'm the person who said, hey, we should build this, but I didn't actually write the first set of code. It's the guy to my right, your left. Uh, Dave wrote the first cuts of code. I didn't start writing code in PostGIS until 2008. Um, but we wrote it because it solved a problem for us in our consulting situation, which was that we were managing, like Metropolis, um, great big piles of shapefiles. And it was not an effective way to handle that data. Uh, we were spending lots of time managing files and not a lot of time interrogating the data, doing things like summaries across the whole corpus were a pain because you had to look at each file. It made sense to have everything organized in one table um, that, you could, that you could query directly. So we ended up starting off, PostGIS uh, 0.1 was just a, uh, a proof of concept. Does this work for us? Um, but it moved on sort of relatively quickly. We were uh, asked to manage the province's road data. We did that in PostGIS um, very early on, within two years of, of producing the software. Fairly simple implementation at that point, distances and indexes. Uh, moved on to doing watershed management, uh, learned things about performance. And what we learned was that as we added more functionality to this database, we were increasingly doing GIS work without ever opening a GIS. We were answering the questions that came to us from government that they expected us to pop open a GIS for, but we were just writing reports in SQL. And that was, that was really freeing um, because, you know, it got faster. We weren't managing all these files. We weren't doing a whole bunch of file load. Everything was just there in the database. And we could publish not just to our little reports, but we could publish directly to the web and thus directly to the customers. Oh, you're asking the same question all the time but you keep changing this parameter. Oh, well I can turn that into a web form and then you can just change the parameter as much as you want and I'll send you the new spatial analysis based on that parameter every time you push the button. Um, and for other developers, and particularly as we grew the company and added more developers, we did not have to teach them a huge stack of GIS software in order to make them useful to customers. We could just say, oh, well, what you're gonna do is you're gonna learn PostGIS, here's the stack of functions, here's your first problem, I'll be back to you in, thank you. Uh, in a few hours and see how it's going and we'll move on to the next problem. Um, so how do you get PostGIS? Uh, given the ubiquity of PostGIS in deployment environments nowadays, it's very likely you'll have to get packages, uh, but you can get them in from Ubuntu and Red Hat. You can get supported uh, certified packages from Crunchy Data. Once they are installed, which generally speaking is they already are, you just type create extension PostGIS. And now you have access to, well, over 700 spatial functions all of which I'm going to enumerate for you now. <laughs> as quickly as I can. Mm. 
So the number one feature of PostGIS is freedom. Um, PostGIS is 100% open source. If you're interested in how it is implemented, you can go to the GitHub repository and see all of our code. If you're interested in improving it, you can send us patches and pull requests, and we will look at them and tell you that you've done it wrong. <laughs> and then we'll help you make it better. We'll make sure that you can meet your use case in PostGIS, because we love to hear about people who are using PostGIS, and we love to hear about people who are solving their problems with PostGIS. That is easily one of the things that makes me happiest in the world. Um, we have been through the valley of death under the shadow of darkness, and its name has been NoSQL. Um, but we're coming out of the valley, and I have to say, and you will see with all these slides, that we believe that the very best architecture, the most useful architecture you can provide under your applications is a yes SQL architecture. Um, <laughs> one that allows you to take advantage of not only simple document storage and retrieval and speed, which is what you get generally with NoSQL no databases, but also a huge parcel of analytical functionality without having to tie yourself in knots. You can do GIS without the GIS. And to demonstrate what I mean by that, let me give you some standard GIS questions and how you would answer them without the GIS. What parcels are within a kilometer of the fire? So this question, right? Here's the fire. I want to tell everyone to get away from the fire. Um, how do I find all those people? I le surely I will write hundreds of lines of SQL code, or perhaps five. Um, I will select the phone number of everyone who lives within 1,000 meters of the fire. That's it. That's the whole thing. Um, how far did the bus travel last week? You've put the GPS unit on the bus. Uh, you've kept track of all its little points. You've stuck them into the bus table. Um, it looks kind of like this. Our bus is moving around. It's generating, generating tracks. Um, so we find the ID of the bus, which in this case we'll say is 12. We get all the ve vehicle paths for that bus. We restrict it to just the last week. And we sum up the lengths of all the geometries. That's how far the bus traveled in the last week. Again, a massive 400, oh, excuse me, four lines of SQL code. Uh, find me the nearest truck to the transformer. Looks kind of like this. There's all the transformers. There's the truck. One of them is nearest. Um, how do you do that? This is a little bit longer because we're making a, a, pl a plea to the index-assisted um, nearest neighbor operator, the little, I call it the TIE fighter operator. It's the green one there. Looks like Darth Vader's TIE fighter. Um, but it orders things in order of distance um, using the index, so it gets you results, and I'll show you how fast it can do results later. Um, again, six lines, seven lines of SQL. Uh, what trucks are in the service depots? So if you have trucks and you have service depots, just a simple spatial join. I want to find all the things from the truck table that link up to things in the depot table on the condition of trucks in depots. That's what it looks like. Give me the, yard, or the yards, give me the trucks, where, Trucks are in yards, or truck or yards contain trucks. Those are fair inverses. Um, and only look at the service depots. Again, five lines of SQL. You can answer very, very complex questions very, very quickly using this language, and you don't have to even write very much of it. Um, so what do you expect from a spatial database? What are the basics? Um, like I said, you need geometry and geography. So how do you declare a column? There's no fancy side tables. There's no magic, um, magic formats. Uh, you just declare a table like you would in SQL. I'd like a table, please. It has the following columns with the following names, and these columns have the following types. And amongst the types I might choose are geometry and geography. They don't look any different from the other types. Um, just like, say, a var car, which can have a length restriction of 20. A geometry can have a type restriction of point or line or polygon or multipoint or multiline or multipolygon. And it can have a spatial reference system restriction, in this case, 26910 which dereferences to UTM-10, uh, and I'll show you how that works later. Um, and same thing with geography. Primitive types, uh, we get these from the international standards. So SSQL defines for us the point, line, string, and polygon types. Uh, the aggregates on those, multi-point, multi-line, string, multi-polygon. And then the generic, everything in the bucket, geometry collection that can hold all types at all times. Um, from ISO, we pick up arcs. So circular string is a collection of circular arcs. Compound curve is a mixture of circular arcs and linear, linear segments. Um, and then they got a, a whole bunch of uh, aggregates on top of those, multi-curves, multi-surfaces. Multi um, and then ISO began work on, but never quite finished, uh, specifications for volumetric types. Um, so from the ISO extended sort of draft models, uh, we ended up picking up the idea of a polyhedral surface. 
So that gives you a solid that you can form in any shape you want. Um, they also, in an extended draft, talked about tins, uh, which gives us a primitive triangle, which is more or less useless, um, but is packed together into a triangulated irregular network, a tin, which can be very useful for modeling surfaces, generally elevation surfaces, but really any surface can be modeled as a tin. Cost surfaces, think of a temperature surface. These things can all be represented with a tin object. And then, you know, our own sort of parsing of the problem. There are two ways to interpret a line string or a polygon or a point. You can interpret that feature in Cartesian space, and that's the space we're used to because it's kind of the space we live in. Um, or you can interpret, and it's called you know, R3 if you're doing it in three dimensions, R2 if you're in two dimensions, and R, I guess, stands for real if you're into mathematical theory. R1 is the line, the number string. R2 is the Cartesian plane with real numbers. R3 is the Cartesian volume. Um, or S2, which is an er embedded Cartesian space. It's a flat space, but it's embedded on a sphere. And those two uh, types differ in how you interpret um, connections between points. So the connection between two points in R2 or R3 is a straight line. The connection between two points in S2 on the sphere is a great circle. And for very small lines, it doesn't really matter. You know, we can simplify our world right now by pretending we're living in R3 because that's the way it looks. But if we look at long enough distances, it begins to fall apart. You have to start thinking about things in terms of what we live on, which is an oblate spheroid. That's where geography comes into, into, into use. To make all these operations fast, finding, finding features with spatial filters, um, we have indexes which understand multidimensional spaces, um, R trees for range-based uh, shapes, KD trees for things like points, um, implemented across both two-dimensional and higher dimensions. All of that stuff together allows us to do GIS without the GIS. And GIS without the GIS, this is the part where I start explaining to the database people. I never did this, though. Um, people who use PostGIS, I want to do this earlier, so a third to a half. People who are post just curious, <laughs> another third to a half. Um, full on database people, ah, oh, good, okay, nice. So, um, yeah, I've, I've operated in a weird space over the years. Um, I spent my previous 10 years working for companies that would describe themselves as spatial companies. So I spent a lot of time talking to GIS people about databases and tried to explain to them the value of having your data in a database. It's amazingly helpful. Um, and now I'm with a database company, so I spent a lot of time talking to database people and explaining to them the amazing value of using location data, which is already in your database. It's extremely useful. So this is kind of the reverse argument, which is database people understand that things have relations to each other. You know, tables represent objects usually, and those tables have relationships between them. But database people assume those table relationships are explicit that there is a foreign key in one table which joins up to another key in another table, and you can use those explicit relationships to reason about stuff in the larger database. And spatial people understand, either implicitly or explicitly, uh, what uh, geography professor Walter Tober called his first law of geography, which is everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things. And my colleague Martin Davis, who works with me for Crunchy in Victoria in the Geospatial Center of Excellence, because we're excellent, um, likes to say that, the, that spatial is the universal key. You don't need a foreign key, primary key. You've got spatial. You have a universal key to bring together things which otherwise are disparate. And I touched briefly on the idea of a spatial join. You have two tables. They are unrelated by anything except for the fact that the objects in those tables have a location. And if they have a location, you can begin to integrate things which would otherwise be unintegrable and add value that which otherwise would be not extractable from these different data sets. Say you're Walmart. Does anyone hear Walmart? Phew. Okay, so say you're Walmart. Um, and you've got a, a database of customers. Point of sale data, right? For every transaction, you know who made the transaction, you know where the person lived. You know with a great deal of fidelity who buys Red Sox. But you do not know anything about those people beyond the fact that they buy red socks. And you would like to. Your marketing campaigns might like to take advantage of things about where they live, who they are. Did they spend a lot of time at university? Are they at an age where they're going to be having children soon? Are they going to be at an age where they're going to need canes and walkers soon? Um, do they make a lot of money? Do they make a little bit of money? None of that is in their database. And there are two ways for them to figure that out. One would be to draw a random sample from their database and conduct 
an expensive social survey across those people, which would be difficult because, hi, I'm calling from Walmart, can you tell me how much money you make? Is not a question which they're likely to get a lot of responses on. Um, but fortunately for them, there is an organization which has gone out and collected that information and put out statistical summaries for the entire population of the United States um, and attached those statistical summaries to geography, geometry, census tracts, county subdivisions, census subdivisions. Take the data at the finest resolution you can. It's got all that fun statistical information that otherwise is unavailable and stick them together. If you can stick them together, you can say, for any person, here is an estimate of their sort of aggregate demographic information. This is approximately how many years of education they have. This is approximately the median uh, income of all the people who live in that tract. You would think that is an incredibly difficult operation to carry out um, across hundreds of millions of customers and tens of thousands of census tracts. But in fact, like the previous examples, it is the matter of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines of SQL. That's what it takes to carry the spatial join. That is literally the query you would write to run a spatial join between your customer's table and your census geometry table. It's very, very simple. Um, I think that is the single most common pattern you'll see in spatial SQL. So when you come back to it over and over again, it's what's used to enrich one table of data with information from another table of data. Uh, second most common query people ask about is, I want to find the nearest blah to the blah. Ah, yes, I, I'm always looking for coffee. I built a whole keynote around that, but it's not this one. <laughs> um, so how do I find the nearest Starbucks from here? Um, again, this is uh, using the TIE Fighter operator. Oh, this is the, I guess I use customers. I should have put in Starbucks. Um, but yeah, I select everything from the table I'm interested in, but I order by the distance to the place I am. And then I limit it by how many results I want. Um, so if I want the nearest, I limit it to one, and that's the nearest. If I limit it to 10, that's the 10 nearest in the order of their nearestness. It's really, really fast because it's based on an index search. Um, and when I say really, really fast, I mean really, really fast. Uh, this is two million genus points, geographic names points. Um, if you pick one of those points and then find the 10 nearest things to that point, um, the query will look something like this, picking one point, selecting out its geometry, then finding the 10 nearest things. Um, it will take all of 10 milliseconds to find that answer for you across 2 million inputs. And you can increase it to 20 million inputs, and that number will not change dramatically because it's mostly scaled on how many things you bring back. If you bring back the nearest 10,000 things, it will take a bit longer. Um, but it's really mostly about how much stuff you want to get off the index. Um, it's an incredibly fast search uh, for nearest neighbor. You can do um, a spatial join based on the idea of nearest neighbor. So given for every entry in this table here, give me the nearest neighbor of it from this other table. It gets kind of ugly, um, but it works. It's called a lateral join. I'm just going to leave it there for one second. Got it? Okay, everyone understands. Wonderful. Um, so how does all this work? Uh, PostGIS consists of a fair amount of code, um, but not everything which is cool and amazing in PostGIS is actually right in the co PostGIS code base. Like lots of software, PostGIS depends on external libraries to provide its functionality. So the internal architecture of PostGIS is inside the database, you define a function using the create function, create function commands in the database, which ties a function name, in this case st area, to a dynamic linking library, um, the postgis.so library. And in turn, in that postgis.so library, you define some C functions that match up to that binding, and magic occurs. So you get something which looks like SQL on the SQL side, but in fact executes in native C in the engine. It's a wonderful, wonderful system. Um, and it works for all extensions. PostGIS.so, in turn, links to a whole bunch of support libraries. Um, and it's worth talking about them a bit so you understand um, why particular versions of libraries give you different capabilities. Um, the ones from a geospatial point of view we use a lot are libgeos. Geos stands for Geometry Engine Open Source. It is the computational geometry library. So things like buffers, uh, intersections, unions of geometry are all carried out by the geos library. Um, proj, libproj, that's a Cart uh, cartographic reprojection library. So changing projections from UTM to, to uh, geographics and vice versa. Um, 
Seagull is another computational geometry library. All the uh, functions around solids and uh, volumetric uh, are handled by Seagull. And Google is a library for handling raster uh, data. So a lot of the functionality in the raster module of PostGIS derives from, from GDOM. And now you have some other, or other libraries you use for thing, things like creating fancy formats and so on, protobuffers and JSON and XML. But the really cool stuff is the stuff I think that does uh, the mapping stuff. So libproj uh, takes geographics and converts them to Cartesian coordinates, uh, takes Cartesian coordinates and converts them back to geographics, so forward and inverse projections. It also handles uh, spheroid transformation, which is a vastly more technical and difficult problem. Um, so it can take you from, I guess, in North America, the most common example of the past 20 years would have been NAD 27 to NAD 83. It'll soon be NAD 83 to NAD 2021, 20, because NOAA is about to give us new datums. Um, so everyone will be relearning that problem, which uh, the graybeards among us have already learned, datum transformations. Um, all that is sort of hidden. There's an immense amount of code. It's incre incredibly complex. Uh, for the purposes of a user of PostGIS, you literally need to know only one function, uh, transform. So you select the geometry you're going to transform. It's projection on. You tell it which spatial reference ID you want to transform it to, and it just happens. Um, we support Prod 6 and Prod 7, which is a new API for Proj, which gives us access to the new features of Proj. Time-dependent datums are coming. Uh, they're a big deal in Australia and New Zealand because those places move very fast, relatively speaking, like 10 centimeters a year. They have, they have quick moving plates. Uh, our plates move too slower, <laughs> but they move. I live in Victoria. Um, about every three to 500 years, our plates move extremely fast. <laughs> Um, for a very short period of time, um, and everything falls down. So, uh, so I'm not looking forward to the seven meter shift that's in my future, um, but it's coming. And uh, at that time, all the, data, all the data will have to be updated because it will immediately be seven meters out of date. Um, it now comes with a built-in EPSG database, which gives it access to very high precision transformations between geoids. Uh, we're used to grid shifts between NAD27 and NAD83, but if you want to go between different spheroid definitions on um, the old code, ended up throwing in between one and 10 centimeters of error uh, just by the way it was implemented. Now it does direct transforms. It's much, much more accurate. And Prod supports one or two projections. Um, pretty much every projection you'll use, uh, EPS, every projection in the EPSG database, basically, and then a whole bunch that aren't. Um, so local, local Cartesian projections are the things that uh, oil and gas producers provide, but also strange global projections. I think you can do that Dymaxion on this one. Certainly various, all the varieties of Robinsons for different global projections are there. Um, it's a fun thing to play with just to see all the different projections. The Geometry Engine open source. So, so this is the, uh, the key to all the logic around um, spatial relationships and the constructive geometry around things like unions and differences and intersections and so on. Um, it implements this is a, my other favorite phrase of art. This is from the OGC Simple Features for SQL specification. The dimensionally extended nine intersection model, which is uh, being shown to you there for an example of two polygons. Uh, the dimensionally extended nine intersection model characterizes the relationship between any two objects in terms of the nine uh, intersection modes of the interior, boundary, and exterior of the objects. So. Two objects have different relationships based on how their boundaries, interiors, and exteriors interact. Those are two overlapping objects, so they have particular interactions. Two touching objects have different ob interactions. Two disjoint objects have different interactions. And they can be specified very completely with, it's probably easier to say it, the Egenhofer matrix. Max Egenhofer is the guy who invented the dimensionally extended nine intersection model. Um, it is the core of the simple features model. So Oracle Spatial, PostGIS, anyone who does simple features geometry even if they don't talk about it because it tends to scare people away and or make them pass out, um, use that model as the underlying model for how they deal with relationships. Uh, why would you want something as abstruse as a dimensionally extended nine intersection model? Um, I found it very useful in my consulting career for quality control because you could express spatial relationships in the DE9IM that were not expressible using simple logical predicates. Um, so, the classic one was finding valid docks in the planimetric data of the province of BC. And a valid dock is one which is inside a lake, but not floating in the lake. That's not a very good dock if it's not attached to the shore. Um, only attached at one end. The other end is floating in the 
side. And at the end only attached one dimensionally, so not like this one down at the bottom where part of it is sort of strung along the shoreline. No, there were specific rules about the, in the planetometric model for the base map of the province of British Columbia, which had to be followed. And given the uh, 100,000 lakes and 50,000 docks, whatever it was, being able to run this in one pass across the whole database and say, here are the 15 that don't follow your spec was immensely powerful. And it did not in involve only one call to a uh, ST relate function, not attempts to put it together with strange uh, nestings of Boolean functions. Um, the PostGIS implementation of the DE9IM is more full featured, I think, than any other database. Oracle has one, but it's, it's actually, they, they threw some stuff out because they found it too difficult. Um, you can simplify uh, understandings of relationships down to simple Boolean uh, functions. These are the ones you generally use day to day. You don't use the DE9IM patterns hardly at all, only for crazy quality control. You use these Boolean ones all the time. Uh, we already saw the use of in intersects and contains and spatial joins. Um, touches, overlaps are fairly straightforward. Uh, things that touch share a boundary, but nothing else. Things that overlap share an interior. Um, Crosses and covers don't make a lot of sense for polygons, although you can apply them that way, but they're generally used, or crosses is used for linear, linear features. Um, it allows you to characterize the relationships between two features with just a Boolean return type. And then in addition to these sort of testing functions that return Booleans, we have a whole bunch of constructive geometry functions as well. So if you're doing unioning, um, intersections, differences, symmetric differences, these are all constructive geometry. Uh-oh. Never touch your computer. Constructive geometry functions. Never spill water on your computer. Um, these are <laughs> constructive geometry functions that take in geometries and spit out a geometry as a result. Um, so all those and then buffer in addition. Um, the union as specified by the standards is a union of two inputs. Um, when you're in database world, like the very first thing you think is, wait a minute, I don't want to just union two things. I want to union sets of things, because set-wise logic is how the database works. So, I mean, pretty much the first thing we built upon having access to this library was a proper database aggregate for geometries. So you can express a query, this is against the counties of the United States, you know, select ST union of county geometry grouped by state code, and what pops out is a table of states. It's pretty magical. And you can do that with any polygon set, any line set, any point set. You can apply these functions, group them together, and create new outputs. Um, buffers, uh, the implementation in, uh, in GIOS includes both positive and negative buffering, um, which allows you to do, I think, a pretty cool operation. This is something that people usually did in, uh, in raster GISs back in the day, um, but you can still do it in vector GISs. Um, I got asked, a colleague of mine, I can't remember why she was asking it, um, but she said, you know, I've got this data set, um, and it's too detailed. It's like one to 50,000 data, and I want to show, like, a whole province-wide map, um, but it's stupid to map out this multi-megabyte file. Is there any way for us to simplify it but keep the original shapes? Um, and we do have other simplification functions, which I'll show you, but those tend to uh, strip out usually more points that people want um, to get the smallest they want. And they don't do a good job at retaining, um, retaining fine, uh, fine features. So this, this is the Gulf Islands just north of where I live. Um, too detailed. So what you do is you take your data and you buffer it. You make it bigger. So there's a positive buffer. And then you apply a negative buffer to that positive buffer. And what happens is a lot of the sort of fine features kind of erode away. And you end up with this thing which is much more amenable to standard simplifications. Now you can just throw a Douglas Poiker filter at it and get rid of sort of collinear features, uh, collinear vertices. And you end up with this much smaller and yet kind of really well-formed shapes that are good for overview mapping. Um, just with a simple two-stepper. Make it bigger, make it smaller again, throw a little bit of Douglas Poiker on to get rid of collinear collinearities, and you've got this uh, lovely overview. Geometry. So just one quick thing about that. Because yeah. Even though I know you're pressed for time. I'm so pressed for time. Steve. Because you wanted to talk about 750 functions in 45 minutes. Um, but that's also really good for people who do a lot of web mapping. Because yes. usually what comes back from your database is a gazillion points, and then you try to draw the polygon with a gazillion points, and you're like, I don't understand why it's so slow. Yeah. Well, you're trying to show 100,000 points and move them around in a, job, in a browser, and Chrome's already up to four gigs of RAM just to show the page first place. So those are row functions before you return the actual features, 
can actually make your web app performant at a scale that matches the pixel that you see. Yep, and I, I have a whole section about that that you're keeping me from getting to. But yeah, the number one performance uh, performance advice, <laughs> the number one performance advice is make it smaller. Just make it smaller. Um, GS also gives us the ability to build Delano triangulations, which then also gives us Voronoi polygons, also known as Thiessen polygons. Very useful for spatial analytics, taking point data and turning it into polygon data, take that polygon data and do things like spatial joins with it, bring that stuff back onto the points. It's really, really powerful for doing things like market sheds. Um, and it can do this other thing. This is like GIS without the GIS. Um, divide a polygon into an arbitrary number of similar subpolygons. This is a this is a question which I think ordinarily it would you just get some operator, some poor sad operator to go and digitize them. But you can do it just using functions in the database. Um, so this is the outline of Peru, which is nicely irregular and concave. Um, we start off with a post function that just generates random points. So you hand it a polygon and say generate points and it will generate n random points inside the polygon. Um, so we filled up our polygon with a dentish collection of points. And um, we can then cluster those points using a k-means clustering function. Um, so now we've actually already kind of subdivided the space. We're almost done, except we don't have output polygons yet. How do we get output polygons? Now we can take those clustered points and for each cluster, calculate the centroid. The centroid is the center of mass, so it neatly approximates the, uh, the center we want. Um, now we have points. Those are wonderful inputs to a DLNA uh, triangulation, which we convert into the dual, the Voronoi pol polygons. Um, now we've subdivided our outline of Peru. The only trouble is the, uh, the Voronoi polygons extend outside the boundary of Peru, so we want to clip them. That's easy enough. We just take the intersection of the Voronoi polygons with the original data. Ta-da! We've gone from one polygon to k, in this case I think it was like nine, um, using only the functions inside the database. That's, that's GIS without the GIS. Um, so the geometry engine open source used extensively by PostGIS is also used across the whole swath of the open source geospatial uh, ecosystem. So if you're using QGIS, you're also using GIS. If you're using MapServer, you're also using GIS. If you're using Shapely, the Python library for, uh, for uh, spatial analytics, that also is using GIS. Uh, here in Crunchy, we spend a lot of time working on the GIS library because it's core to PostGIS, but we always feel happy knowing that we're also bringing the, uh, the bar up for the rest of the geospatial ecosystem. I mentioned we use Seagull, another library. Uh, we use it primarily for volumetrics, but also other 3D calculations and some odd stuff, odds and sods, a straight skeleton, for example. Take any polygon, turn it into a linear representation of that polygon. Um, volumetric stuff, so given a 2D uh, shape and a vector of extrusion, turn that into a 3D volumetric shape. Um, standard thing you expect for sets of volumetric data, take two volumetrics and intersect them, take two volumetrics and union them. Um, Google library used primarily for raster data, all the kinds of stuff you'd expect in a raster type. Um, you can take your raster data, resample, rescale, re rotate, um, convert it out into um, viewable formats like JPEGs and PNGs, um, or vectorize them. Take a shape with um, a mask and turn that into a set of vectors that's equivalent to it. Um, and then there's all the things which don't fit into neat categories, <laughs> like, uh, like high dimensionality. Um, so I've been talking a lot about data in a two-dimensional sense, but all the data, all the data types I've talked about, points, lines, polygons, multi-points, all that good stuff, um, it's not just two-dimensional, it's also three-dimensional. You can also represent four-dimensional things. And when you do so, all the indexes understand that, so the indexes understand higher dimensionality. You can build three-dimensional, you can build four-dimensional indexes. Um, representations, pretty straightforward. You just add in the token to say what dimensionality you have and add in the extra dimensions to the representation. And then the functions understand. So, <clears throat> wow, I put an error in my thing. Oh, that's a shame. All uh, right. And the inputs and outputs understand higher dimensionality. So if you ask for the as JSON of a higher dimensional point, it gives you back the three coordinates. Um, everything transfers in and out. It's not just a bolt-on. It's, it's part of our core functionality, really from version zero. We've understood the idea that we need higher dimensionality. Uh, when you start adding things like that third dimension, like that Z, you can end up with these, in these sort of philosophical angels dancing on the head of a pin question, like, uh, huh, if I ask for distance, what distance should I get back? You know, the distance between two 3D things, what distance should I get back? Should I get back the 3D distance? Or should I get the pr back the projected distance where I put them on the 2D plane and calculate the distance between them? And the answer is, it depends. 
Um, it depends on what your use case is. So in order to get around that, basically um, all the non 3D tagged functions do things in 2D. And if you're explicitly wanting a 3D result, you use a function that has a little 3D prefix on it. So 3D distance, when fed, 3D objects will give you the Cartesian three space answer. Um, same thing with all the other ones. Um, ordinary distance fed to 3D things will give you the Cartesian two space answer. Um, yeah, why would you want 3D length versus length? Because, you know, stuff goes up and down. 3D length is different from 2D length, particularly in hilly places. Indexes, uh, again, nothing more complex. Again, you have to sort of specify though. Most people are doing their searches, even when they have 3D objects, they're doing their searches in two space. Um, and the 3D goes along for the ride. But some people actually do three space searches. Um, they actually have truly volumetric data, oil and gas companies. Um, or they have spatial temporal data, where it's X, Y, and T. Basically, the, as long as the dimensions X, Y, and T, or X, Y, and Z all have enough range to them, it might make sense to have a three space search, in which case you still build a spatial index, you just specify that you're using n dimensional operations instead of two dimensional operations, which is the default. Um, I showed you nearest neighbor, nearest neighbor works in higher dimensions. Not much more to say than that. It looks exactly the same, except you fed it a higher dimensional input. Um, it only works fast in higher dimensions if you have a higher dimensional index built. That's the only quirk. Um, you want index assisted nearest neighbor, you have to have an index that makes sense for that assist. So three space nearest neighbor, you need a three space index. Um, but I haven't mentioned four dimensions. What's the fourth dimension? Yeah, or if you're a GIS person, what's the fourth dimension? <laughs> yeah, it's that other thing, which we're not gonna give a name. Uh, so what you call measure. Um, and the shapefile has had measure. The shapefile was specified in 92, I think. I think they extended it within a couple years to have three and four dimensions. And the fourth dimension was measure. Um, so measured objects end up looking like this. Four dimensions, you can tag them. The fun thing about um, measure and Z is that it's possible to have three dimensional things with different kinds of dimensionality like a line string M and a line string Z are both three dimensional, but they're quite different three dimensionals. Um, so you can never get away with just saying, oh, it's three dimensional without specifying. And the third dimension is M or Z. If it's four dimensional, it's obvious it's ZM. Um, so what do people use M for? Classic, the reason why Esri added to the shapefile. Highways departments love measure because they love linear referencing systems. They've built their whole infrastructure management systems on the idea of measure, on the idea of this asset is at mile 35 on highway six. Um, now I need to dereference that and get a geographic point or vice versa, I have a geographic point, tell me what the measure is on the line. So that's what you use measure for. The other people who got really into this is fisheries biologists. Fisheries biologists really, really love to be able to measure presence and absence of fish. Um, and because they tend to overlap a lot, um, this is the same reason the, the highways departments like it. They don't want to make a new geometry for every fish reach on the network because then they have this huge stack of tiny little segments, none of which quite line up together in space. So instead they say, here's our canonical network of water. Just tell us how far upstream and downstream every fish presence and absence is. That becomes a nice side table. You can dereference it and get the shapes out anytime you want, but you're not managing this huge stack of lines. That's why fish people like it, that's why highways people like it. For highways, it's like we treated the road from this mile to this mile with tar, and then the year after we did from this mile to this mile, and they overlap a little bit here, but not there. It allows them to model that stuff again without producing this explosion of extra geospatial data. So there's utility functions for doing that linear interpolation operation, turning measures into locations, turning locations back into measures. Um, but yeah, once you say, I have four dimensions. Most rational people will say, oh, you're talking about time, right? If you're not a GIS person, you say, ah, time, yes. The fourth dimension. Um, or in, if it's two-dimensional data, the third dimension. Anyways, it's the time thing. And time lets you model things like trajectories, which is great because lots of things, particularly in this day and age now when we're all walking around with our little GPS devices, everything is producing a trajectory all the time. And that's sort of the difference between when M was invented and now. The time N was invented was quite costly and not a lot of things produced trajectories. Now everything produces a trajectory. 
Um, so the idea of modeling spatial temporals become very important. So we've added the idea of spatial temporal functions that understand your m dimension as a time. Um, the expectation usually is that it's an epoch second, um, but you can model it any way you like. Um, and the ability to analyze data understanding that they're temporal. So they generally have a, they have a monotonic direction in their time, um, and you can do things like given two trajectories, find the point at which they were closest, um, taking, into, taking into account time, because it's two, two trajectories will very often cross in space, but obviously they don't cross very often in time because then everything would be hitting each other. They only come a certain distance apart if you take time into account. So closest point of approach is sort of the primitive, then we've got all sorts of stuff around that. Um, what is the distance between things at closest point of approach? What are the closest point of approach? That kind of stuff. Um, also in the grab bag, I mentioned ISO curves. They're a part of the core uh, feature set of PostGIS. Um, so you can model the idea of uh, ISO curves. The crazy thing about ISO curves is that not everyone supports them. In fact, almost nobody supports them. They are not that popular. Um, civil engineers love them because it's a wonderful way to model a cul-de-sac. I will put a circle in and I will use a curve because I wouldn't want to degrade my cul-de-sac at all. So civil engineers love, love curves. But in order to integrate those curves with the rest of the software world, you have to turn them into something the rest of the software world understands. That would be a linear approximation of same. So we can turn curves into lines. Frustratingly, the very first thing people do once you've turned their curve into a linear approximation is say, I have a whole bunch of linear approximations. Can you turn them back into curves for me? So yes, we do that as well. <laughs> um, far harder, I might add, <laughs> to go in the other direction. Um, people generating trajectories walking around the GPS units or phones these days, um, they're producing implicit lines, uh, so standard utility functions to take ordered collections of points and turn them into lines, the make line function. Once you've created a line by generating an ordered set of points, uh, then actually the next thing you want to do is turn them into areas, so we have a build area function that takes in lines and converts them into the best approximate area. Um, When you start doing this sort of geometry manipulation, what you end up doing is a lot of sort of shredding things and putting things back together. So those were three functions that put things together. They took small things like points turned into lines, took small things like lines turned into polygons. Um, when you get complex things, inevitably you want to take them apart. Um, there's OGC standard functions for taking them apart. You get the nth geometry of a collection, the nth point of a line, the nth ring of a polygon. Um, those tend to be less performing than doing a Postgres version of the same, which is to do a set returning function. That's a feature which not every database has necessarily. Um, so they're not specified in OGC. So we have dump, which takes collections and dumps them into their, into a set of the geometries. We dump rings, which takes polygons and sets out their rings and dump points, which takes any object and dumps it into just a great big tuple set of the vertices in the, in the object. So I mentioned briefly geography, this idea that uh, there's two ways to model connections between points, and those ways matter, particularly as things get larger. Um, so there's the greatest circle distance between two points, and that's what you get when you use a geography type. And there's the straight line distance, that's what you get when you use a geometry type. Um, so who needs these things? Uh, you would think, you know, that uh, people could maybe get away with just linear interpolations, but there are, there are two categories of folks who need a, a whole world data model. Uh, the first category is actually represented here, crazily enough. Uh, there are organizations um, actually, no, this is the first category that isn't represented here. Oh, maybe there are. GeoNewbies. So these are folks whose first, uh, first exposure to GIS is like the Google Maps API. Um, so they understand all locations in terms of latitude and longitude. Um, but they want to get results in useful units. They want to say, given these two points of latitude and longitude, what's their distance? I want the result in miles or meters or something metric that I can work with. I don't want it in angular units. Um, so that's the first category. It's kind of hard for folks to grok projections when they just arrive to the geospatial world. And geography lets them just dump their data in and get metric results out without doing a whole lot of thinking about it. Uh, the second category is, oh, yeah. So the trouble is, <clears throat> if you put your stuff into Angular units and your data is, in fact, global, things begin to break. So that's, that's a classic one. Um, Chunks of Russia bleed over the dateline. Chunks of Alaska bleed over the dateline. And uh, two-dimensional rendering engines will occasionally go blah when presented with that stuff. 
Um, the category of folks who legitimately have that problem, <laughs> it's not just because it's a learning problem, because they legitimately have global data um, and need to model it. What are you going to do, right? I mean, the satellites go over the poles. They go over the date line. They go wherever they want all the time. There is no planar projection that you can model this stuff on. You've got to put it on a sphere. The data has to not freak out when it goes over the poles. The indexes have to not freak out when they go over the poles and across the date line. Everything just has to magically work. Satellite people, people with true global data, they need a geography type. Um, and you would think, since so many people understand spatial in terms of latitude and longitude, and yet want the answers to come back correct, you know, metric results, all that stuff, that the correct answer would be to just say, you know what, we, just, we only need one model. Why do we even have a Cartesian model? We can just model everything in S2, and then no one will have to worry about this nonsense about projections ever again. Uh, the reason why it's not a great idea is this, which is how do you calculate the distance between those two points? Um, in Cartesian space, it's a little bit of math and one square root. In geographic space, even this is the cheapest way to do it. This is the Haversine function. It assumes a sphere, so it's wrong. Um, it's just less wrong than some of the alternatives. Uh, involves one, two, three, four, five transcendentals and two square roots. Um, it's quite expensive. And you can really see that when you do performance comparisons between the geography type and the geometry type. Um, so most people, we really encourage folks who can work inside a projected domain to learn enough about projections to find a good projection for their area and work there and pretend the world is flat. All the functions work. Um, the performance is as good as they want. Um, because it is so expensive to do calculations on the sphere and because we didn't want to re-implement all the functions which didn't care about the interpolation type for both types, uh, what we ended up doing was, in, was implementing native geography, type, geography functions for a few things which cared. Distance cares if you're on the sphere or not. Length cares if you're on the sphere or not. Area cares if you're on the sphere or not. Um, intersects cares if you're on the sphere or not. But things like nth ring or nth geometry don't care at all. You're just taking apart the representation and handing it back. So we implemented the things which cared, native on geography, and just left all the functions, other functions available as geometry functions and made a straightforward cast from geometry to geography. So things tend to auto-cast. You can get the nth ring off of a geography, but it's casting to geometry, then getting the nth ring, then sending it back to you. I'm not going to talk a lot about it. Uh, we do have a raster type, so you can take continuous raster surfaces and import them into the database. Um, the reason to do that is not to store and then retrieve your imagery for looking at. That's basically making your operations more complex because your database gets very, very large and full of rasters um, while slowing down your access to those rasters because there's not any performance advantage in looking at rasters in the database versus looking at a well-organized file like a TIFF file or a Mr. SID file. Um, what it does allow you to do is to join up your raster data with your vector data transparently inside the database. So again, it's this is power of SQL thing. You're not having to go to multiple apps to get your answer. You can put your continuous data into the database, and I'd say not imagery, but things like elevation, temperature, you know, continuous measurements of things. Then you can do raster vector stuff. So like, like take a bunch of vectors and use them to generate a mask on your raster, you know, apply that mask to your value data, and then summarize up that value data, and you get back this nice, cool summary of what otherwise is continuous data, but applied to your vector data, or vice versa, take your raster data, mask out the values you care about, and generate polygons based on that. Um, this is a cool analytical thing. This is uh, the way we store the raster data is we cut it into page size chips. So I took an elevation model for uh, part of British Columbia I grew up. The loader cuts things into chips, so that's how it ended up looking, at, looking on disk. Um, do a spatial join between those elevation chips and the uh, cut block polygons. And then you can take the cut block polygons and dump them against the rasters, find the uh, average slope across the polygon, and then characterize all those cut blocks in terms of whether they're on steep slopes or not. Logging on steep slopes is bad news because it tends to let the topsoil roll off. Um, it's a cool analysis to do. Similar thing with elevation. You know, here's elevation in Vancouver. Um, here are all the parcels in Vancouver. As, uh, as Greenland and South America melt, bad things will happen. Um, if 
depending on how much things melt, the bad things will be large or small. This is a somewhat large scenario. Um, but yeah, what buildings are going to flood when you bring the sea up by 30 meters? Well, that would be all the buildings that are less than 30 meters in the DEM. So again, it's a spatial join. We find all the DEM chips that intersect with our building polygons, and then we pull the value off the DEM for the centroid of that building, and then just check all the ones that have a value less than 30. So these are the ones that are below future sea level. Um, and then we can just thematic map them. Badoom. So again, it's one, li one line of SQL. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. To fit it on a slide, it's not a lot of SQL, and you're doing a raster vector analysis just right there. Uh, we do support a topology model. This, again, is taken from a SQL MM draft. Oh, I think it now is an official SQL, SQL MM specification. So if you're modeling things that have shared arcs, uh, classics, or parcels, again, municipal agencies tend to like this stuff. You can build them into a topology model. It allows you to explicitly uh, model shared borders and so on. So you move one border and all the objects are, in, are altered. Um, in order to do editing and management of data in topology, you really need good tooling. Um, QGIS does have a PostGIS topology editor to try to make that visual stuff, because you don't want to be typing in topology edit commands in the SQL command line. It's more or less impossible. Uh, performance tips. Here goes. So everyone asks me, is PostGIS faster? Is it fast? It's funny how faster is the, the er question, right? Is it faster? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, PostGIS is faster than Oracle. It's faster than ArcGIS, and it is faster than SQL Server. It is also slower than all of them. It very much depends on the use case you're running. Uh, so I can find you use cases where we will crush any or all of those, and I can find use cases where people will say, no, I ran this on ArcGIS, and it took five minutes. I ran it in PostGIS, and it took 15. Um, it depends. It depends. There's ways to make things faster. What I would say clearly, though, is PostGIS is better than all three of those. Um, and I say that because it's easier to write the spatial SQL in PostGIS than it is in Oracle. Because uh, Oracle Spatial SQL is catastrophic. Um, there is way more functionality in PostGIS Spatial SQL than there is in SQL Server, because Microsoft seemed to get to like the SSF SQL standard and said, we're done. Um, and then because you can write stuff in Spatial SQL and run it, and it's five lines to do these incredibly complex analyses, unlike in ArcGIS, where you have to point and click over and over again, or write many, many, many lines of ArcPy. Um, so how do you make it faster uh, so you can get all those big wins? Performance tweaks, the number one big win is to make it smaller. Uh, so this is a degenerate example. Um, I took every, every watershed, I guess it was, every, every watershed in British Columbia and merged them all together into one ultra polygon uh, with 90,000 vertices. Um, and then tested how fast I could do spatial joins with the one ultra polygon, and then if I could make it faster. And the way you make it faster is by cutting it up, and we provide a utility function for doing that. It's a set returning function. So given any geometry, it will, by, by default, start dicing it and not stop dicing until everything coming out has less than 250 vertices. And the net result, generally speaking, I have found to be between 50 and 30 times faster than just sticking with the large objects. Um, small things get more leverage on the spatial index. Small things don't have to be repeatedly deserialized off the disk. Small things are faster. Um, so yeah, so if you're looking at a big spatial join, you're saying, oh, some of these are quite large objects. The answer is cut them up. Um, first, cut them up using subdivide. And if you don't care a great deal about the boundary accuracy, then follow that up with some simple, or actually you know, precede that with some simplification just to remove things like collinear vertices. Uh, we've got a standard Douglas Poiker simplifier. Uh, we have a, a, it's really hard to pronounce, Visvalangam Wyatt VW uh, simplifier. Visvalangam Wyatt is more useful for polygons. Uh, Douglas Poiker is more useful for linear features. Um, also out of the grad bag, you want to make things faster, lay them out in disk in a spatially contiguous order. So a whole bunch of random things, if you order them, this is the very oldest order by, we just ordered by things by the x-coordinate. That is a terrible order. Um, unless you're proceeding strictly from left to right. Um, as of 2.4, we began to do much smarter sorting. So if you did order by geometry um, in 2.4, we would give you this uh, Morton key. Uh, more recently, we we're going to give you a uh, Hilbert curve order, so they're nice and spatially contiguous. So doing a cluster by order or reordering your table on the geometry value means that all the things um, which pull spatially contiguous stuff, and that's mostly what you do in spatial queries, 
get faster because the data is clustered together where it tends to be near together in space. Um, so yeah, so use it for clustering. I don't mean clustering with nodes in a big warehouse. I mean clustering your data into one place in memory. Um, useful functions, generate points I showed you uh, in action. It's a wonderful way to turn things like census data into data which both maps and analyzes in a different way. So for example, I took all the uh, census polygons in the greater Vancouver area and did a generate point on them. So now instead of getting this sort of blotchy chloropleth map where it's very hard to distinguish between big polygons with only a few people in them and small polygons with a lot of people in them, I get this lovely sort of point density thing going on. Um, and once I have the point density thing going on, I can also start to do neat stuff with clustering algorithms. Like uh, in addition to k-means, we have this dbscan clustering algorithm. That's a proximity clusterer. So this is clustering, what's the thing? Yeah, 100 meter, or sorry, 1,000 meter tolerance. Um, and it's kind of cool. It actually fairly neatly strips out the different uh, bedroom suburbs of Vancouver and sort of the greater Vancouver metro area and finds them as distinct clusters. Um, same idea with k-means. You have to specify your k and it'll give you the, the reasonable clustering for that number of clusters. It allow allows you to do GIS without the GIS. So I'm now 15 minutes over. And I've got 10 more minutes of material. So how do you people like sitting? Are you good with sitting? It is the best part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I won't feel bad if you get up and go to the bathroom because that's totally unfair of me. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so I like the idea of post web architectures. We're going to be talking about this a lot, so let's go really quickly. The main idea, though, is shrink the middleware. We've got so much functionality in the database, you need hardly any middleware software. And the, data, the functionality I'm talking about, a lot of it is about spitting stuff out to standard formats that external software understands. So if you're using QGIS, if you're using a desktop software, those programs are probably running the SD as binary function to get a standard binary representation, which they then convert and show you on their screen. But if you're building a web app, your web browser is probably consuming something like GeoJSON, or maybe if you're drawing it onto a canvas yourself, SCVG, or maybe if you have a modern web mapping client, client that understands vector tiles as MVT, you can produce those things directly in the database and spit them out directly to your web client. So it allows you to build these narrow, narrow, narrow little architectures where you've got functionality in the database, a very thin middleware, and then the client does most of the visualization for you. It allows you to do GIS without the GIS. Um, so I talked about the third-party ecosystem of tools like, uh, like ArcGIS and QGIS that can talk to PostGIS, that allows you to build hybrid architectures. There's also an ecosystem of tools that are Postgres extensions that expect PostGIS to be there. So these are things that Postdate Postis, which said, huh, if we can generate Postis geometries, then we too get access to this huge third party ecosystem of stuff which can work with Postis geometries. So the oldest of them is PG Routing, full featured routing engine. You feed it a network, tell it what kind of algorithm you want to traverse that network, apply whatever weights and so on you want to the edges in real time, so you can change your network dynamically and build routes from point to point. It also does traveling salesmen. It doesn't have to just work on road networks, although a lot of the work has been around driving on road networks. You can stick any network into it. So imagine building a utility thing. Uh, there's, there's all sorts of possibilities. Graph traversal is a really cool thing. LiDAR is everywhere these days. Um, if you want to store your LiDAR and do, just like in the raster world, this sort of co-joint vector versus raster vector versus point cloud analyses. You can store your raw LiDAR data in using the PG point cloud extension, which allows you to convert those points into postgis points so you can see them raw. It also allows you to do things like filter those points so you can do a filtering to find, say, ground level or a particular return number. Look at those in your database or in your GIS system. And the reason you can look at them in your GIS system is because this extension spits out postgis geometries so that postgis becomes the integration point for the rest of the third party ecosystem. Tiger Geocoder, I'm going to talk more about later. Um, Uber released to some great fanfare, their H3 um, hexa hexagonal hexagonalization of the world. They cut the world into hexes with like, what, 12 pent pentagons? Um, and it would be kind of cool just as a standalone thing, but in order to allow people to visualize their hexagons, they also allow you to cast their hexagons to post as geometries, and then you can see them, put them out to the web. So again, it's an integration point. Um, FDW extension for Postgres, 
FDW stands for foreign data wrapper. It allows you to expose as a table foreign data. In the case of the OGR foreign data wrapper, it allows you to expose any data in the format supported by the OGR format library. So if you have a shape file, you can make it look like a table in your database. If you have a remote SQL server, you can make SQL server tables look like local tables in your Postgres database. You can query them, you can edit them, and the edits traverse back to the SQL server. Same thing for Oracle Spatial, same thing for the dozens of formats that OGR supports. It's a very powerful integration tool. Um, so I've talked about everything in PostGIS. I've taken only 25 more minutes than I was allotted. Um, if you want to learn more uh, about some of the third-party things I've talked about, you want to learn more in detail about PostGIS, there's a workshop up top. If you want to take a picture of that slide, feel free. Or um, maybe you just want to write down something. I'll just wait a second for the picture takers. But you don't have to, actually. The next slide has a link. You can just write down the link. And that links to this presentation, so you can have the whole deck to take home and, and give to your kids. Which, you know, everyone, don't you bring home? No. Uh, yeah, so that, that, that's been everything about PostGIS. Uh, yeah, write down that link. That's the link to the deck. Um, and uh, if you are not brutally tired of hearing my voice, I have great news for you, which is I will be talking three more times today about different aspects of using PostGIS with different stuff. So thank you very much for your patience. Uh, I think it's break time, Tim? Yeah? OK. So uh, coffee is back there. Treats are back there. I'm up here. Come ask me questions. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. <laughs>